Yes. Lindwa. Yes. All right. Uh, we will continue on with our regular meeting here with uh, public comment. Seeing no hands raised. Anybody in public? Yes. All righty. Let's move forward with our presentation. We're we'll do our retirement recognition. Thank you all for attending tonight's recognition. We really appreciate having you all here. And we have uh, special gifts for people here as well. So this is exciting. And um, different people are going to say a few words and sort of um, recognition of your dedication to Central Public Schools here. So we have quite a few, but we will start with Bill Luet. He's going to recognize Susan A. I'd like to congratulate Susan Ames for her 34 years in teaching in Sichuan Public Schools. She started at Old Gates teaching eighth grade history for 19 years. Susan then shifted gears and brought her passion for history to fifth graders at the New Jenkins Elementary School for eight years. She is finishing her career at Sichuan High School teaching U.S. and AP history for the past seven years. In the classroom, Susan is patient and never rushed. This leads students to pause, reflect, and to work at develop, developing ideas and answers. Her colleagues in the history department spoke most clearly about Susan's kindness and the way in which she seems to radiate calm in the classroom. Congratulations. Susan. Mr. Ryan Beattie, who is going to say a few words about two different educators here, Jean Chambers and Gail Coughlin. Okay, since 1985, Jean Chambers has opened her students' eyes to the wonders of science. When walking by her classroom, students are always observed engaging in hands-on learning experience to deepen their understanding and appreciation for the world around them. For more than 37 years, Jean has led to Gates Environmental Club and created opportunities for students to become leaders in the school and the local community. Jean's expertise in her content, coupled with her passion for children and devotion to her colleagues, will be missed next year. Congratulations, Jean. Thank you. Next up, uh, Gail Coughlin has played an enormous role at Gates Middle School since 2001. Known by her students as Coach Cough, Gail has continued to find ways to help students remain active and engaged for over 20 years. Gail has coached field hockey, golf, tennis in her tenure, and as a career changer, she has shared that working with adolescents in this second chapter of her life has kept her young and fresh. <laughs> students and staff at Gates will miss her sense of humor, her wisdom, and her unwavering support as she enters retirement next year. Congratulations to you. All right, Superintendent Burkhead will recognize Bonnie Donahue. Thank you. Uh, I'd first like to, oh, as superintendent, recognize all of our retirees tonight, those that could be here and those that couldn't. Um, for all your, there's, there's hundreds of years of service here and, and the 
in my opinion, the most challenging, but yet most rewarding profession of all. Um, and besides the parents, you are the child's first teachers, and we thank you for all you've done. And this is an awesome evening. I have the pleasure of introducing Bonnie Donahue, who has uh, made situate her home away from home for the last 27 years. Um, she started off as a paraprofessional when her youngest child entered kindergarten, and then she spent eight years also as a town treasurer collector in the office. She is, she is our go-to um, historian in the office. We will dearly miss her. She outworks everybody. She works nights, weekends, even when I tell her not to. Um, and we will miss her greatly. We do have her until November, thankfully, but I want to thank uh, Bonnie Donahue for all her service to the district. Thank you. Superintendent Burkhead will also be recognizing Dr. Baca. And uh, Dr. Dutch, uh, this is his uh, second retirement. He was a, uh, uh, so for all of you that are retiring tonight, we do have substitute openings next year as well. Uh, but Dr. Dutch, I called on in a little bit of desperation when I first got this job and I was the only one left in central office on July 1st when the office was, you know, people were retiring or getting other jobs and um, asked him to come apply for this job as a retired superintendent for Upper Cape Vocational School. If you Google that, you can see the many things and the many accomplishments he had there as a superintendent. I uh, was fortunate enough to come here for one year. He's been here for three. Um, I've never been part of a, a, a budget process that's been more transparent, more honest, more ethical, and has done more for a district in a short amount of time. I've certainly learned a ton from him, not only as a uh, business manager, but as a friend and mentor. I will certainly miss him and wish him the best, but know he'll go on to do great things. So I want to thank you, Dr. Dutch. <laughs> It is my pleasure to introduce Liz Dorgan, who is a part of the Citrus Public Schools. She has been teaching for 37 years. She came to us from New Jersey, and in those 37 years, she has had the opportunity to be involved in every grade level from K to H, which a lot of us could not say. But in Citrus, she did her best job ever. She started a program as, as the STEM teacher and really has built it from the ground up. Uh, not only is that uh, in our district, it's in four different buildings. She's able to put the hard work in that have constant growth so that all of the students in our elementary schools are able to be a part of this program. She went out and found resources. Um, she has found a grant. All of the kids use splat maps, and if you don't know what that is, you should see Liz Tolkien at some point, because you'll have quite some fun. She went and took the training at Museum of Science, just in order to make sure that the program continued to grow. Not only do I think that she's fabulous, but recently she was recognized by the uh, New England Patriots as being one of five finalists for STEM Teacher of the Year. Woo! She had the privilege of going. She went off to the stadium to be interviewed. And she was a finalist and has won um, a grant for the Hatherley School. That is not why I think she's wonderful, but she <laughs> that helps. Um, also, not just Gillette thinks that, I can tell you um, the kids absolutely love Mrs. Dorgan. I know this for a fact because in our school, if you have something to talk about, we have a system. You can have a cloudy day, and that means you plop it into the counselor's mailbox, and that means I might want to talk. A tornado, we need to talk. Well, Mrs. Dorgan was out one day. Poor Mrs. Frankie's mailbox had tornadoes galore. <laughs> so when she went to the fourth grade, because they were all coming from the same grade, she would, she pulled kids and it turns out they were quite concerned about Mrs. Dorgan. So Mrs. Frankie spent her morning making sure they understood Mrs. Dorgan will be back next week for sure. So, I personally want to thank you, and I'm honored on behalf of Central Public Schools. I thank you for all the years of service and what you've done for our students. Go, 
robotics too. Oh. <laughs> All right, uh, Bob Dutch to recognize Lori Jordan. So before I say a few words about Lori, um, I just want you to, to understand the impact that our bus drivers have. They're, they're the first face uh, that our students see in the morning. And it's the last face from the school district that they see when they get off the bus in the afternoon. So they truly have an impact on the day and the lives of our students. Lori joined the Sidgwick Public Schools transportation staff as a bus driver in 2016. She came to us from first student transportation. She is one of the one of the top favorites. She's a seasoned vet, a great coworker, we will miss Lori. Congratulations. Uh, okay. uh, Lori Jordan. Uh, I know there was like someone that yeah, you're right. So Mr. B, no. I almost was going to jump out of order, but then I, I didn't. Sorry. I was gonna have Ryan do all of his at once, and I thought it would be Mr. B. Um, okay, so Principal Williams recognized Judy Kelleher. Uh, good evening. My name is Scott Williams. I'm the, well, I guess I'm not so new anymore, but I'm the principal at the Cushing Elementary School. And if you can picture my first staff meeting, hot, sweaty in the cafeteria, 95 degrees, everybody's sweltering. And there's this force of nature that walks in called Judy Keller. <laughs> she had quite the exuberant spirit. And I have to look, I have to say that after decades of service, it was very evident and clear to me that she truly is invested in the children of Sedgwick. Um, she is a force to be reckoned with. She advocates for our kids tirelessly. Um, I interviewed some of her colleagues to get some quotes to describe Judy. She's thoughtful, keeps tabs on how everyone is doing in their lives outside of school. When a student or colleague seems concerned or stressed, her very reassuring, don't worry about it, and it's okay, it's fine. Really help when the days get tough. She can always be found talking to herself and working it out. She has an excellent sense of humor that's very infectious. Filing cabinets for days. Lots of filing with Judy. She manages caseloads across two schools, which is no small feat or task. She knows and connects with each individual child. She genuinely cares. And I think what, what captures the spirit of Judy is she has an amazing sense of humanity. So Judy, best of luck to you. Uh, see, uh, Principal Julie Ford to recognize Levina McKenna. Levina has been with the Situate Public Schools for, that's what I can, no, <laughs> she knows. Um, anyhow, Levina has been with the Situate Public Schools for the last 27 years. Before that, she worked in Maine, and she also taught in, kin uh, in Connecticut for a while at a private school. But she came to us in Situate as a special educator and is absolutely the perfect person for that role. She has a vast knowledge of programs and strategies. She's the type of person that never doubts that a student can learn. It might, she might need to exhaust different ways of going about it. She breaks lessons down into unique strategies to help that student, but Levina never gives up. She knows that every student can learn. She also has the ability to really build strong relationships with students. A couple of years ago, we had a fifth grader who came in new to us and very, very quiet. And I went in to see the line with the lesson and I was like, whoa, who is this boy? He was like exuberant and doing the lesson. You could just see the relationship Mrs. McKenna had taken to the time to build. And because of that, this little person was meeting with success. This year, or I would say the last couple of years, she's um, evolved into another position in our school. 
She is the person we all go to every Monday we meet and we go to and say, okay, Levina, what do you think? To even today we had a meeting and we find that her wise um, way of thinking, her way of thinking about the, what kids need now not only stays with Levina, it comes to all of us because she helps to really guide all of us in our decisions. She absolutely has had a tremendous impact on the Situate Public Schools and all of the students who have been so lucky to have had her. Congratulations. All right, uh, Heidi Driscoll to recognize Donna Moffat. I'm not sure where to stand. This is interesting. <laughs> um, so um, Donna's not here with us tonight. She couldn't make it, but I'd like to say a few words about her. Um, I'm happy to recognize someone who has been one of my situate mentors since I've arrived. Um, Donna has been an educator for nearly 20 years and has served, has served situate public schools for 14 as an elementary teacher at Hatherley the elementary STEM coordinator, the Cushing principal, and as our district supplemental services coordinator. Her passion for connecting students with STEM learning not only shined when she was the curriculum coordinator, but she also shines in her current role. As a direct result of her work, the district has been able to implement successful outside of the school day, accessible STEM plus programming K-3, all grant funded, um, which is only one of Donna's many accomplishments this year that impacted students and teachers alike. Donna is looking forward to moving to Florida and enjoying lots of time camping with her family. So congratulations to Donna. Okay. Brian Beatty to recognize Shan Morrissey. All right, Shan cannot be here tonight, uh, but Shan began her career at Gates as a paraprofessional in 2003. After supporting students in this role, she transitioned into the role of special educator and supported and has supported hundreds of students with disabilities to achieve and to become more confident in themselves as learners and young people. Shan's outside of the box thinking, her commitment to her own continuous improvement, and her caring concern for her students and colleagues will be missed next year. Congratulations to Shan. Linda also is not able to be with us this evening, uh, but I would like to say a few words. Uh, Glenda came to the Situate Public Schools 19 years ago as a bus driver. Prior to arriving, she was a professional driver for Greyhound Bus before getting her school bus driver's license. Her students and parents love her. She's been out for a little while this year and they already are missing her. Glenda ran a tight ship the safety of her students was paramount. She ran a uh, tight, tight ship with me as well. She straightened me out as soon as I got it. <laughs> Staff in the office, as well as her fellow bus drivers, are missing her. Glenda, we wish you a happy and healthy retirement. Thank you, Beatty. I'll only ask you to come up one more time. <laughs> Eileen Roddy, as well as Karen Smith. Wonderful. All right. Eileen Roddy has inspired students in art rooms across the district since 1999. Beginning her time in situate at Cushing, Ben Jenkins, and finishing her career at Gates has allowed Eileen to help thousands of children develop their craft and confidence as young artists. Eileen is known for her passion for art and for children. She has coordinated several visits from guest artists and public, public exhibitions of student work throughout our community. She is equally well known for her advocacy for our profession. Eileen served as president of the Situate Teachers Association and as a building representative for many years, and she continues to mentor and inspire her colleagues every day. Eileen has made everyone fortunate enough to interact with her and laugh and want to be the best they can be, and she will be greatly missed next year. Congratulations, Eileen. Thank you. Okay. 
Kate and Karen Smith. Karen Smith has taught Gates, uh, taught math at Gates since 2000. Karen's mission as a teacher has always been to build students' confidence and skills using her engaging instructional strategies. Students have learned angle types through dance, rules for solving equations through music, and strategies to alleviate anxiety before and during tests through brain gym. Karen is a world traveler and has shared her tales from across the continents with her students to inspire them to acknowledge the world around them. Karen's dedication to her students and the strong friendship she has developed with her colleagues will be missed in years to come. Congratulations, Karen. Jean Shea. Thank you. Jean Shea has been our uh, TBI in our district for 34 years. She has worked with students with um, various degrees of vision impairments, which is a very highly specialized field. In her role, she has worked directly with students. She has done evaluations. She has done training. She has consulted with staff and parents. Um, one of the things about Jean is that she has worked with kids from the ages of three until 22. So in her 34 years, she has seen them grow up. Um, she, she mentioned to me that she loves the kids as her own. She really is um, quite involved with them. She is looking forward to her retirement to spend more time with her grandchildren, maybe take some painting classes and get some more sleep. <laughs> we'll greatly miss Jean. Lisa Absolute pleasure to introduce Lisa Sturgis. Lisa is a reading specialist at the Hadley School. She has been at the Hadley School for the last 16 years. Just a little piece of trivia, she came as a package deal with Donna Moffat from Middleborough, same, <laughs> yeah, same place. But we are so lucky that this is where she has landed. You're lucky when you're an educator and you have a classroom of kids and you get to touch their lives and help them. Lisa Sturgis has the opportunity to touch the lives of every student that goes through Hatherley. If she's not directly teaching them how to read, she's helping teachers to figure out how to teach kids to how to read. She sincerely is the backbone of our reading program. Her high energy and enthusiasm within the building is just <coughs> contagious. It is a marvelous morning when Lisa walks in to greet you, give you the rundown of everything that happened during her life last night and roll along down the hallway. It really, really is such a pleasure. If a student begins to struggle in reading, Lisa doesn't, doesn't just give a quick pass and hope. She knows that every child can read. She digs into data, into assessments until she finds the obstacle that is causing this little person to slow down reading just long enough so she makes sure they move along in our reading. I know I speak for parents that have also worked with Lisa Sturgis. They know that they, this is their little person who's not picking reading up as quickly, but they go into Lisa and Lisa's like, no worries, I've got this. She finds ways to help those kids. And then she follows up and says, Guess what? This is the progress that they've made. I knew they could do it, and they really are doing it. And it's just incredible to watch. Also, she finds a way to, to really feed the love of reading with kids. If somebody says, oh, I watched robotics, next thing you know, they have got 15 books to choose from. Because Lisa went to the library, to my shelf, to every shelf she could find, to find just the right book that that child might want to read. What an absolute pleasure it has been, both personally and professionally, for me to be able to have landed at the Hadley School with you. You will be tremendously missed. But when you're home and you're thinking, now what I do? You know what to do? Sit there and think about all of the kids that you have impacted personally. Congratulations. <laughs> When I retire, I want Julie for it. <laughs> Everybody in this room knows. <laughs> Thank you. Just really good at it. 
very, very sweet. All right, uh, Assistant Superintendent Driscoll to recognize Steve Swart. Now the press. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know if anyone can accept the challenge, it's you. Okay, I'm gonna go over here so I can look at Steve. So thank you for allowing me to take this opportunity to recognize technology Steve himself, <laughs> Steve Sweat, who has been the fearless leader of the social studies department for 17 years and an educator for 39 years. He has served as a mentor for countless students and teachers who truly appreciate his style especially his sense of humor. The students of the situation who love him highlighted his many positions he's had in education that include, but are not limited to, kindergarten teacher, boarding school dean, classroom teacher, and lacrosse coach. Steve is one of the most passionate educators who I've had the pleasure to work with in Sidgwick. He's a person who's committed to the challenging the status quo. <coughs> and he works hard to do what's right for students. Um, so you may not know this, but I'm actually Steve's evaluator. And at the end of every evaluation, I always ask whoever it is, is there anything I've left out? Um, is there anything you want me to include? And Steve said that I left out how handsome he is. <laughs> and while I did recognize his incredible work with the teachers and students, I would like to formally apologize <laughs> for not initially acknowledging his excellence as an educator and his incredible good looks. <laughs> we all wish him an amazing retirement filled with family and joy. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, and last but absolutely certainly not least, Principal Reardon to recognize Jim Riesel. Okay, that's two really hard ones to follow. <laughs> that's two really hard ones to, to follow <laughs> and to be last, but I'll do my best. Um, Julie's not here with us this evening. Um, but um, on her behalf, I'd like to say that Wampatuck is saying farewell to a talented and highly respected educator. Julie Sylvester has taught 21 years for the Central Public Schools. She's been a teacher in the ECC, a SPED teacher at Jenkins, and a kindergarten teacher at Cushing and at Wampatuck. She spent the majority of her career teaching our youngest scholars from pre-K to second grade. Julie is known for leading with her heart and approaching every child and staff member with good intentions. Her kind, compassionate approach to teaching and learning is evident in the culture of her classroom. On any given day, an observer in her room will see students engaged in purposeful play, hands-on activities, authentic writing, art, and science experiments, just to name a few. As an Orton Dillingham trained reading specialist, Julie has spent endless hours teaching students to be lifelong readers. She has been a mentor to many new teachers and a colleague always willing to lend a helping hand. As Julie wraps up her public school teaching career, the Wampatuck community would like to thank her for helping to shape the hearts and minds of our students, and we want to wish her all the best. Thank you. All right, that wraps up our recognition of all of our retirees. Thank you all so much for, I can't even count the amount of years, hundreds of years, as Superintendent Burkhead said, of service to situate, situate students. You just, you know, it's we're really happy for you that you, um, you know, get to have this retirement time now and please enjoy. And again, just thank you so much for, for really raising our children and, and educating them and together with us. And we really thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all that you have done. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, uh, we'll move forward with our celebration of student learning with our secondary STEM presentation with department chair Liz Prendel for math and Tasha Newton for science and friends. <laughs> Um, thank you for having us. Actually, I'm. It's on. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, that's that's on. Um, thank you for having us. But more importantly, um, as you say, and friends, we're actually going to hand it over to um, the Citro Robotics team um, under the direction of Miss Carrie Hallahan, who works in the math department. Um, we thought long and hard about how to really capture what kids get to do in classes and the application of it. And um, this is like the most perfect opportunity for them to showcase what they can do. So I'm gonna pass over the microphone and let them take, take over. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Claire, this is Ms. Hallahan in Vermont. And I have the, <clears throat> the privilege to represent the Cyber Sailors Robotics team. And we're just gonna tell you a little bit about what we do as a team and why we all love robotics so much. <laughs> Okay, so before I show you this, this quick little clip of, of the uh, robotics competition, I just wanna give you some context of what you're actually seeing. So First Robotics is an international competition. They release their game for the season in January. And then by March, teams across the globe have to bring their robot competition ready, put it down on a field and turn it on and hope it plays the game well. <laughs> and um, so in this video, you'll see our robot is Right here, this might be a little hard to track, but you'll see we're working with two other red robots. They're on a, what's called an alliance with us. So they're teams from the New England district that we're working with to score points and win that match. And there's probably 70 matches per competition. So you'll see us um, back up onto what they call a charge station, which is basically just a balance board that our robot has autonomously, we've up uploaded code, put it into our robot, and it runs on its own. So in this video, no student is controlling it, but it's going to back up and balance itself. It like measures the angle that the, it recognizes the angle that it's at and can adjust to where it's level. So that's what you'll see in this video. You miss out on the audio, but there's a lot of uh, screaming and excitement. <laughs> <laughs> And then around us, you'll kind of see that other robots at the same time are scoring points and moving around the field, trying to get as many game pieces as they can while we balance. So we got points for doing that and they got points for placing the game pieces where they need to on different pegs and stations and stuff like that. I think it's going again. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> can see a little bit better this time here. <laughs> So I just mentioned that FIRST Robotics is, is an absolutely prestigious organization. The fact that our students are involved is an incredible opportunity for them to, uh, to make connections professionally and beyond. And, can you, this, this. and as a mathematics and programming teacher here at the high school, I can talk firsthand about the curricular connections that these students are making. And this is my first year being involved, but I have to tell you, when I first walked into the meeting room, we use the, the technology lab at the end of this hallway, uh, I wanted to cry with joy because the students were debating the design of a claw. Uh, really the first time watching them do this, they were having a healthy debate over what style of, of mechanics they should use. And with their knowledge of physics and mathematics, and discussing the programming involved in this. And so, yay, I was so excited. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Granted, it's, uh, it's, it's many awesome hours of, of math and science. Kudos to these kids for pouring their heart and soul into this. But I wanted to mention that they are truly using the robotics knowledge. If, if any kids have taken the robotics courses, also using a lot of pre-calculus and physics, naturally, a lot of moving parts in this robot. 
And what I am most excited about as one of the programming teachers here is that the students want to program the robot. That's the most elusive part, it's super exciting. And uh, so we've been boosting enrollment in our programming classes as a result, but truly we're having wonderful conversations of, of you know, what should your course progression look like as you go through high school so that you get to do more with the robot. <laughs> and the students are also teaching each other. We're creating a badge system where students and, and mentors teach the students what they need to progress to the next level. But truthfully, beyond the mechanics and the tech aspect, these students are marketing, they are communicating, team building. I'm honestly floored at this opportunity, at what it provides the students and what it drives them to want to learn. It's wonderful. Um, here are some pictures of us uh, this year uh, trying to work out with our robot. So here's us just testing the claw, uh, with, as you can see with this cube here. Um, and then here's us at a competition making a quick fix after something broke. <laughs> Has happened often. <laughs> um, here's was, here was one of our claw designs. So we were all fighting over how do we grab this, these cubes and these cones. I don't know if we have a cube with us, but we have a cone here. We'll show you a demonstration later, <laughs> grabbing it with the robot and everything. Um, so here's one of the designs uh, or one of our students, Wesley, uh, was like debating over how do we grab this? And then there's all the calculations that we use to like make it work. Um, here's some more pictures. This was us in our first year trying to figure out how do we put this robot together? How do we make it work? Um, and then this was us this year when we got our new drive base, which is like the whole driving part of the robot. Um, and we were really happy about it. So we were driving in the hallway. Everyone was so happy. Um, <laughs> and then and here's us. Um, at one of our competitions after the code didn't work. So we had our lead coder, Ned, fix it all up for us. <laughs> so truthfully, uh, as anyone who's seen these meets and has seen this team working, uh, this is a, a major community <coughs> involvement. There's, there's no way that a simple school club can manage this. Truthfully, <laughs> it's massive. And so we, we all have to honor all of the community participants and we truthfully would not be able to do anything without the Situa First Robotics Booster Organization. Yay, thank you so much. It uh, costs around $20,000 a year to run the robot. So uh, many thanks to the boosters. And our students are mentoring each other, but also they're super eager to help younger students. And they're, they're chomping at the bit to create workshops for eighth graders and elementary students. And that's, that's in the works, so you can look forward to that. And the mentor system, uh, you need so many adult brains involved in this as well. Uh, none of us really have the full blown knowledge except for Mr. Dumay. <laughs> we are, it's a, it's a, an, an absolute honor to have him in this district offering his expertise because he's probably one of the few people who knows all of the working parts of the robot. So thank you for your time now. <laughs>
a little game on the Pier 44 parking lot. <laughs> and so uh, we had a lot of fun doing that with all those teams. And so we're looking forward to doing that again. Yeah, so I mentioned the sponsorships earlier. These were our sponsors for the 2023 season, and we had the sponsors for the 2022 season as well. They're essential. Couldn't, couldn't, we wouldn't be here without them. So slide just for them. <laughs> and as an educator, as I mentioned, I love seeing the learning that happens here, and I'm floored at the, the many levels of learning and the, the relationships that are forged here. And it's been an honor to also talk with parents to hear their perspective because I'm new and this is new to them as well. And how wonderful has it been for them to, to share that the students are excited to go and do their schoolwork. They're more excited to learn. That's awesome. <laughs> um, but one of the other things that I really love about our team, it's incredibly welcoming. Uh, we are kind of known at competitions as being the vibrant, excitable and super warm teams. And let's keep that going. It's, it's really a, a wonderful vibe. <laughs> it's essentially written into our mission statement. <laughs> but one of the things that we strive to do is, is to be super inclusive and supportive. And essentially we feel like family at this point. So very excited to have that opportunity for our Citrus High students. And also, because FIRST is so prestigious, truthfully, uh, it's really a cool opportunity for, for us to hold on to students that might be tempted to go elsewhere because they're excited, they want to get their hands on the robot and learn with us. So that's been a wonderful addition. And one of the other interesting things to see as our club progresses, since we were so new this year, this was our first year of actually having seniors to graduate which is kind of a novelty for clubs. Usually you've had hundreds of people graduate from the club. But this year with our two uh, members who are graduating, they're both pursuing STEM careers and STEM futures. Lily George, who will come join us in a minute at UVA and Elisa. Hi everyone, I'm Lily and I joined the revised team my junior year of high school and I had no clue what anything was and thanks to this happening in the team um, and it was the best decision I made in my high school um, career. I got to meet such amazing people and mentors and form awesome relationships while learning so many skills from marketing to CAD to just any hands-on activity and I'm so thankful that I get to continue on with learning about everything that goes behind in the process because there's so much more that goes into this robot than just building. Um, so I'm so thankful for everything that I've learned and all the people I've met. And I'm looking forward to being the first alumni and coming back to support the team through our competitions and hopefully we'll come we can raise for some plane tickets. We're back from Virginia, but uh, I'm so excited and I'm so thankful for FIRST and everything that we've learned. Thank you. Do you have any questions for us before we demonstrate the clock? <laughs> Just to give you a little context of what you're looking at too, but at, the, um, at the district's competition, so we qualified for kind of another level of competition. We put out a whiteboard in one of the main pathways and said, draw something, and we wrote it in chalk on the floor. So this is everyone's contribution from over, I think it was 90 teams, 100 teams, and just different drawings and doodles people did while they were walking by. So. Any questions? <laughs> um, first of all, thank you so much. This is um, this is amazing stuff. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit more about how this started. I feel like this filled such a great niche for a lot of our students at the high school. Where this is not to be negative, but I'm not sure what you guys would be doing if we didn't have the cyber sailors. And I just feel like this. Is Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> really funny because I have no idea really what goes on over here, but as you may know, I know how to organize people, and I know lots of teenagers, and I know a good thing when I see it. So um, it was actually, uh, my, I had four children, such a public school students, two, one is a recent alum, my daughter Lucy graduated at Friday's beautiful ceremony, but prior to that, my son Rowan 
um, took engineering classes with Mr. Mengels, who was a former STEM teacher here. And it was, he got the little bug and I had no idea really. Um, <laughs> um, but he was really interested in it and I befriended Mr. Mingles. I had built a relationship with the Citroen High School teacher and he was always telling me about um, co-curricular activities and things like that and so fast forward to COVID and I saw my friend Mrs. Grant who was an MIT engineer we were at a soccer game and I said you know we, when Rowan was looking at, at uh, that student my oldest was looking into colleges um, we didn't have, frankly, the extracurricular opportunity to provide for him. So when you're applying to go to an engineering program, they're looking for you know, an invention, a patent, or a robotics team. You need a portfolio piece outside of your classes. We have more AP computer science classes now to offer, but there was no really viable extracurricular thing to add to your resume. So certainly some kids could do that on their own, but we didn't have that as a school offering. So I was mad. So um, Mr. Mingles, I kept asking him questions and then I bumped into my engineer friend here at soccer and I said, hey, Bethany, will you help me? And she said, absolutely. So we both um, you know, did some Google searches. I came up with my little Marie plan and we went to Mr. Corrado who replaced Mr. Mingles as an engineering teacher here at Situate High School. So he was the first teacher that said yes. Um, and he, we did a wonderful job with him over COVID. So this is actually year three of having a team second year of competing. The first year, Mr. Corrado and Mrs. Grant and I did all the organizing with a couple of students that were still with us. Um, and we sort of laid the groundwork for last year. Mr. Corrado helped us. It, frankly, it's so much work. It's too much work for one teacher. So we kind of scared him away. Um, and then Dr. McGuire helped us trick Ms. Hallahan into the job. And then we tricked a community member into doing it. So that's, that's how it happened. Um, but it was, it is a, a beautiful situation story of brilliant children, wonderful teachers, and a community of support. And you just put those things together and look what they do. There's like awards everywhere and MIT scholarships and we can do anything. So thank you for saying yes. And thanks to these folks, Stephanie and Mr. Quinlan in the back, another engineer friend of mine. Um, are the three, three are on the boosters board and always looking for help on that piece. Um, but the, you know, there's people knocking on the door. We have eighth graders asking to do the team next year, and you know, there's no end to what we can do if we keep you know giving teachers the tools and support to, to get to the you kiddos. Know, so thank you. You might not drive it too much, it depends on how the floor feels about it. <laughs> yeah, when we were doing the um, asphalt parking lot picnic, we kind of burned a little bit of the wheels off. So. <laughs> so it's just, we'll see how the driving goes, but we will be picking up the cone. Um, in the game, we were picking up cones and those inflatable cubes you saw in the picture earlier and placing them on different platforms and different posts that the cones would go on. So we're just going to hope it works out. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's nice. <laughs> 
So that's our team member. So every single team is assigned a number. Um, so every single team is assigned a number. Um, and so we're like the 8,000th team to sign up. Um, a lot of teams have disbanded. So like, like out of the 8,000 teams, there might be like a thousand teams that aren't a part of the first network anymore. Um, but there's still like, I think there were 7,000 teams that competed this year. So all around the world, there's teams in Israel and Canada and uh, France. In France. <laughs> that's that's amazing. Yeah. You guys Thank should you. be so proud of yourselves. Yeah. Sorry. So my wife just texted me because she is home with our 11-year-old and twin 8-year-olds, and they're wondering when you're coming into the elementary school. <laughs> Shops this summer um, at the library, okay. um, and so we'll let you know. Yeah. Henry will probably be sending out an email. <laughs> <laughs> said, 
I saw a business startup. I saw to me, which was hieroglyphics on the board. Um, I saw work groups. It was like a combination of, of Einstein's laboratory, a Google workspace, what I envision Google uh, professionals doing in their jobs, and a little bit of battle bots all in one. And I would drop down periodically just to see the practices before the event that I watched live stream. And kids, it, just how, I'm just so proud and warms my heart how well you work together collaboratively because we're going to be talking about our strategic plan tonight and the words are like collaboration, communication, um, problem solving, critical thinking. All those come up, but we rarely have definitions to show firsthand. So that all of that is happening in your space. And the best thing about it is you're enjoying it. So, so to do something you love and to do something so brilliant is exciting and to Ms. Fenwick's point, it's my job now to think of other inspirational uh, passions that kids have and bring them to life and find a way to make that happen. So you're the inspiration to me to look for that to happen. I know you're the inspiration for people watching. We have children here, 8 and 11 watching. So the pressure's on for us to, to continue to grow this and other great things. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. You're, you're inspiring. members in, in the audience we're going to talk uh, in our board on the strategic plan this evening um, 
I'm extremely excited for this night. It's been months and months of preparation and work, uh, and there's a lot of work to do still. Tonight we're voting on the concept, if you will, and then there'll be some more meat to the bone that we need to put into that will bring together the plan to action steps and to goals that will be reflected in district goals, administrative goals, all the way down to teacher goals, and then impacts student learning, and then frequent reports out on the strategic plan. So this is a uh, vision and guide uh, map, very comprehensive one that was uh, very involved with um, Sprenlini and Dr. Kowski on this board who may help me uh, answer questions as well as may ask questions tonight on the plan. I know we have Mr. Quinlan in the audience. Uh, that was also very helpful um, as well as many other people. So I'm very to call him. Uh, Ms. Driscoll and um, our friends from TLA, we uh, came in to help support us. And I know Mr. Lee is here from TLA um, and uh, to answer any questions on the process if we, if we need to. Uh, Mr. Giannetti and Mr. My, and Dr. Mahasas were also part of that team that came in, so I want to thank them as well. Um, okay, it's a five-year plan, so um, right off the bat, you can see um, a set sail, dream, explore, and discover. I'll get into what that all means, but um, you know, adding a little context, we we kind of were in survival mode with COVID, and we had the two pillars which guided us, I think, very well. But they were a lot more top down. They were more reactionary. They were um, a path to get us through that. And I think we got through the other side very well. This is now a roadmap for the next five years um, that is malleable and flexible, but also gives us some direction and identity. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So here's me with our, our seniors who graduated Friday night. Kick things off. Next slide, please. And oh, the, and the first question back to sorry. Uh, this, this often came up under the two pillars. How do we define excellence? And that was a conversation that went, that went on in a lot of these meetings. It was asked in our survey questions. And I think we did a good job of uh, coming up with um, what that means to situate. And I also think what I love about this plan is it's very unique to situate. We looked at other plans. We compared against other plans, even local ones. Um, and across the state, and I think um, what I loved about ours is ours is uh, is very unique to situate and very unique in and of itself to meet our needs and our community needs, which I love. Um, just a brief shot for our community of the amount of people that were on the committee. Uh, this does not count the other folks who all participated in the focus groups and the surveys and thought exchanges. Uh, this again was open to the entire community. Every community member had a, an opportunity to participate and all information and data from those responses and involvement were used by this committee to formulate this plan. So this was a true comprehensive collective collab in a collaborative uh, community plan. So as you can see up here, um, community has uh, two documents, the plan and the presentation. Those will all be given out after the vote tonight to the community. So um, tonight we'll go to the presentation. I'll explain the best I can. And then certainly anybody that was part of the committee can supplement anything that I, I do miss or they want to add to this. So that there are three phases that we broke this down to. Um, first phase was building the foundation. So that was a lot of data collection. And we, we, we had ample. Um, and that was on performance data, everything from MCAS scores to uh, internal data into disciplinary data, um, you name it, we put it all into a folder and the committee was able to access that and look at that and use that as part of the process. We also solicited feedback from the community as I've discussed through surveys, through in-person person focus groups broken up by multiple groups, whether it's students, families, staff, community members, school committee, select board, you name it, we included it. Um, and then uh, those uh, feedback were also uh, done with the community through focus groups. So that was all the data collection and information gathering, which TLA did a lot of front loading with that information. Uh, we felt that was important for credibility and for trust that an outside group would collect that information, that it wasn't us internally grabbing it, that they asked for all the documents uh, inherent in what information they needed to uh, develop to help us develop this plan. Phase two is building the plan. And this was uh, established in the committee, which you saw initially, but that was uh, purposely. 
We spent a lot of time on that with TLA, uh, coming up with a representative group that had membership from all different groups and walks of life inside uh, the Situa community. Um, and we feel really good about that. It came down to boiled down about 22 members. We analyzed the uh, internal and external data that I talked about in phase one, and that was uh, several meetings and um, several conversations and depth conversations about that, and what it meant, what trends we saw. Um, and from that, uh, we also used a previous strategic plan that was uh, expiring last year to look at, uh, to compare. Um, and we established a mission, core values and vision, which are the driving forces behind any strategic plan. And I'll get into those uh, shortly. Phase three was implementing, uh, is implementing the plan. So strategies that will be used to employ, ensure that the district improvement will highlight these focus areas. And tonight we'll share some of those. And then as I mentioned before, those will translate into actual, uh, tonight we'll have a point person that I'll share with you from central office. And the next step will be to, um, over the summer to work on very detailed action steps and plans to achieve those uh, and timelines so we can be held accountable and also to be able to check in um, on our progress over the course of five years and to balance those five years so that we're stacking things so, so that they're happening sequentially um, and that we're doing it in a pace that we can attain goals. Next one is the plan implementation, both vertically and horizontally to guide the change process over the next five years. I think I mentioned that, is that we make sure that we plan accordingly. So those are the three phases and on the right you'll see School committee looking at this and using this now as a guiding document to come up with their goals. Superintendent's goals will be feed, will feed off of those, which will trickle down to the school leadership, then to the staff, and then to um, the ultimate goal of student growth. So the unveiling tonight for the first time officially of our mission, core values, and vision. Uh, the mission or what we do. Again, these were many conversations, a lot of wordsmithing, and what is unique to Situate, and a very collaborative, and I think, you know, if not unanimous, highly uh, high con uh, consensus was uh, agreed upon on all of these. And even the, how we use words that are unique to Situate, as you'll notice, the capital W-E is not a typo. It's uh, we, not me, is often originally uh, by, um, Mr. Adams, but something we really believe in and practice in our actions. So together, we, all of us, inspire, support, challenge all learners. That includes our students, obviously, but we wanted all learners also to mean everybody. All of us in this room, the adults, we wanted to model learning that everybody continues to learn uh, and improve in their life. What better way as educators and school community members and parents and community members to model for our children that we are lifelong learners and can always learn and grow. So that's that and to reach their unique potential. I think we all like that is that every child is unique. Every adult is unique. Everyone has potential. Those potentials may be different. We start at different places. We end at different places and we all want to improve and grow and be our best. So I think that's what summarizes the mission. I'll, I'll stop there and, and see if anybody this point that is either on the committee or has any questions to chime in on anything at this point. No, I especially like the, um, we help learners reach their unique potential because so many times we hear about, um, you know, test scores and, um, you know, where we go to college and, and that to me, you're trying to fit all students into one, you know, what, what is the perfect student outcome when everybody is so different and you can't right. do that. So I really thank, like that. Thank you for catching that. I appreciate that. That was intentional. And if you recall, some of the older ones five, eight, 10 years ago were 21st century learners. Everybody had that. How generic. You know, so we really wanted to be unique here. We really wanted to be held accountable, accountable to make everyone's, uh, every child is unique and everyone has a potential that I want to reach. So I think that's sky's the limit with that. And it really intentionally has us focus on meeting the needs of every child and succeeding in doing so. So, and, and, and another thing about these, um, if you know the group NIES, the New England Association of Schools and Colleges comes and evaluates schools periodically um, and accredits you, and that's important. 
and we had one recently done a few years back that'll be coming back to assess us. Um, and I've been on those groups that come in and assess other schools, and I've been on the part where my school has been assessed. What I always look for is that the, the students, especially when you go in, you ask them, what's your mission? What's your core values? What's your vision? In their own terms and in their own words, they're able to articulate that. And a lot of times what schools are doing, and again, why this, I love this is so unique, is they might be two or three pages long and no one's gonna remember that. It's in a book and it collects dust. And what I really love about these, you could, even after tonight, hopefully a lot of this will sink in with our folks. And as we begin to explain them to folks and deliver these in our curriculum, in our conversations, in our public relations, in our communications, that we will actually be you know, bringing these words to life and that you know, my, my hope, and I think everyone in the, in the group's hope, is that we start hearing kids talk about this. I'm gonna reach my potential and I am unique, I'm special. And this is how I learn differently than this one. And, or a parent saying, you know, we, we're working with the school to inspire these kids. We're partners with the school and the teachers. And so when we start hearing that stuff, we start seeing the capital we, I think we've really done something special. So uh, that leads into the core values. And you know, what are our beliefs? We reach every student by, so this is a little, how to here and guiding, guidance on that. And we really felt strongly about equity. And I think, you know, and I know I'm very proud of our district for taking the lead on that and being courageous enough to say that and ensuring that there's equity, so that everybody um, is treated fairly, equitably, has a level playing ground, um, you know, and, and has that opportunity and feels like this is a special place for them. Um, and everyone has a really unique, um, you know, definition of that, but that's something we'll work on. Ensuring equity, what is that? What does it mean? How does it translate into our learning and teaching? <clears throat> Nurturing perseverance, growth and achievement. Again, the old days used to be uh, achievement for all students, very generic. Uh, this is very specific. I think perseverance is an, is an extremely important characteristic of, of um, <coughs> high performing individuals, growth, same thing. Um, it's very important, no matter where the child is at, our job is that they grow from one year's time to one year's growth. And so that's a cool thing. And achievement. And we can define that achievement. Achievement is a lot of ways. It's social, emotional, it's academic. It's tonight we saw it's our, you know, it's our students performing in clubs and activities, it's athletics, it's drama. So there's a lot of ways achievement. Later on, we'll talk about the celebrating of that. And the next one, and I might also want to point out that these are in no particular order. So when people see safety down here, that doesn't mean we don't value safety as a highest priority, but investing in safety. And I like the word investing there because we could just say safety. Um, that's lip service. So we want to invest in that. We want to use our budget to reflect that we're spending money on what we, um, the physical structures of our buildings, also in teaching it in our classrooms and our trainings and working together with our um, community groups like our police and fire and, and safety support, which we're doing now, but uh, certainly can improve on. So that's investing in safety as a community. And then the last one is engaging with the community. Um, and you can see how it goes back to the we. Um, it takes a village to raise a child and we want that to be, you know, in real life and in, in, in real education, that it's a partnership. It's everybody, and the more hands on deck, and I think, again, I keep referring back to what I saw in front of me tonight, the cyber sailors, right? A community member thought of it, a teacher had to say yes, the kids got involved. Great things can happen when we're all on the same team and pulling for the same goals. So that's what the community piece is. And that also um, involves great communication, which is, I think is the cornerstone of a lot of this, is to make sure that we have a really strong communication that you'll see later on in the, in the presentation. And the last one is the vision. What do we aspire to be? And, you know, we spent a lot of time on this. And this, again, no one has one like this. And we like the, also the theme of not, you know, of uh, nautical theme of uh, setting sail and situate being an oceanfront community. Um, and setting sail is just, you know, we're all starting this journey. So you're setting sail, you're starting your journey here in situate. We want people to be able to dream big if we want the dreams to come true, we want them to have them, to not stop dreaming, to have, to have hope, to explore, 
to have many opportunities to explore and to find something that you're passionate about and love uh, and discover. And that's the whole process of learning, I think. And that sometimes when we get into compliance, we lose some of these things. So that's what that is. And again, those haven't been specifically defined. That's the fun of the work to be done. But I think that some of those are self-explanatory and, and those will be branded everywhere we go with that so that folks will know that you know that's kind of where we want to be so i'll stop i must stand on step one touch does anybody else have a comment or put on <coughs> just uh, quickly quick. first of all this first of all this is gets me excited again i feel like we're kind of like i don't know it's really cool to just kind of we just uh, be reactive and so on. This really just like a, I don't know, a, a direction, a clear direction. I don't think that through no one's fault that we haven't been able to focus on. I think it just really um, determines that. So thank you, Tessa. We, I think I have, or the three of us that weren't on the committee has an easy job because we can now see what you presented. I just have one question and then one observation, which is kind of off topic, but I, I love good at that. Um, I love the mission. I love the mission where it says we challenge, uh, support all learners to reach their unique potential. But then in the core values is we reach every student by ensuring equity. Should was that discussed? Because I know that you had yep. said. Yes. I don't have a problem with it, but I just wanted to point it out. I'll let Kerry maybe start with that, and then we can. And then I have something off. So the answer is yes. Okay. That's all I need to know. <laughs> it was discussed a lot. Okay. So That's all I need to know. One of my comments is related to yours. First, I was so happy that the mission stuck with learners because many of us in the room felt like we're all learners. We bring a curiosity, growth mindset, learners, it's teacher, and also valuing our teachers and their professional journey. I think, and, and others here who were there should, this is just my interpretation of we reach every student there was some concern, I think justified, there was some real concern about learners and that we are a public education system, an institution here because we're educating students. And so there was some, I think there were some questions, I don't know if it was worry, but there were just questions that people in the community would wonder had we lost our way a little bit because we weren't wholly focused on students. And so is that fair? Is that a fair yeah, assessment? No, it's, it's fair. Yeah. yeah. So okay. that that was really, I think, why we, we made sure to, to name students no, it's, um, I just, attention. No, it's, I, I think it's great. I don't have an issue. I just wanted to, and I'm, yeah. I was assuming that you had some discussion about it. Which, I'm glad you discussion. asked because we will need to explain that to the community too, because that's what we wrestled with yeah. in that room. And we knew that we wanted to have both learners in. We do want the folks to, yeah. as Dr. Preston said that, we're here for students, yes. let's not forget that. Yeah. And because we're situated, we want to be the best, we're here for the adults too. And we're all learning and growing because great teachers make great kids, yep. and great students and great learners and great families and all that kind of good stuff. So I think we try to do the best. Right. No, it's great. And then this, this isn't really part of the strategic <laughs> plan. Uh, I love the vision, set sail, dream, explore, discover. But our mascot, I'm not sure if it's an anchor or it's a sailor. And it's, right now, no, that's not no, no, I don't want to talk about it. I just, it's just, I lie. I, 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 I agree with the vision. The mascot is a sailor. The logo is the anchor. Okay. I think so that is maybe I could throw another uh, French. Right. Well, I like the. I, I love the logo. Yeah. I like the logo, but it doesn't set sail. It's, no, it's not even. Okay, we'll discuss. Not, that. You, I I, I thank you for that off topic question because I, I'll <laughs> circle it back in. I hope I'm right because uh, one of our, our beloved community members, Val Baker, I think, and I think Mr. Quinlan also had something to say about this. We're very passionate, and uh, we all agree that um, the lighthouse would be an excellent like beacon of light. We could do a lot of things with that. Um, and, you know, you know um, Ed's here, but they're going to take this and then they send it to a professional. Um, to call it graphic design. graphic designer, and they take they're going to take um, some of the lighthouse pictures and really make it look beautiful and put this all around it. So it's not going to be an anchor or a um, sailor. It's going to be unique to the strategic plan, which is we thought we think we landed on a lighthouse, which would bring a special unique connotation to this. Great. No, thank you. 
It, it's funny that Peter, you keyed in on because my other my other comment was um, I hadn't thought about it. I think there's so many ways that you can unpack set sail because you 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 articulated when you described it just now. You said to start your journey, and when I think of set sail, I was actually like. It's actually you're meeting the learner exactly where they are. So you don't have to be starting your journey to set sail. You could be, be already partly there and getting back on, right? Yeah. So I think yeah. it's interesting to sort of have a play on that sort of. Well, I think we'll have fun with that because yeah. if you recall, set sail was actually at the end. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. it was originally dream, explore, <laughs> discover, and set sail. And then we went back and forth that same. What does set sail mean? I asked that question yeah. because we have to explain this. But I think some of the fun of this is it's not done yet is these are the conversations we need to have with everybody and it may mean something different to other different people and that's okay but we decided to put it at the front so that's a work in progress but a very healthy and good conversation to have. You, just a couple comments on that lighthouse i think that's awesome i think it's great and i don't know if you're going to take current pictures but there's no top to lighthouse right now <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> got some that we were taking before that. Um, I think Val might but, but, on that, some too. Yeah, Val uh, but on that it would be interesting with the set sail set sail theme, the anchor could be coming up like in motion. <laughs> Something to think about. Lose that you add <laughs> Mr. Gates to that kind of the uh, of one. <laughs> yeah, right? he'll come with the I thought I you said you didn't like the anchor. Now you want to get into the I, I, no, no, I, I, I think the anchor is I really like the anchor. I like the anchor. It's a nice it's logo. Dry. It's a nice logo, but, but, it, but it's it, the purpose of an anchor is not dry. I, I, Correct. We're gonna get that. Correct. <laughs> but we have it so many different places that if we, I don't know if it's gonna change. I don't know what this lighthouse is, where else it's gonna be other than just on the strategic. <laughs> just like we painted the school a different color for you, we're painting it all uh, over. <laughs> all right. No, I, you'll love it. No, I do like the anchor. I think it's a cool logo. It's just not probably unless it's coming up off the What's ground. To like, no, like, no, we can no. make it the school <laughs> committee logo. Perfect. So, no, this on is your new year. On our new year. Yeah. yeah. Yes. yeah. But in all seriousness, I think that does bring up that marketing question of we shouldn't have yeah. you know, a vast array of symbols. We should probably streamline and get it before all that. I tell no. you that right now. We're not getting all oh. that. Yeah, I want no more comment. That's a third reel for me. So I'm going to be waiting down. <laughs> but overall, this, this is I'm excited by this great. Thank you. I'm equally excited. All right, next slide, please. So uh, the theory of action is an if-then statement. It kind of combines what, you, what you've seen already. Um, so if we um, provide learning experiences in a safe, challenging, equitable, and inclusive environment that is enhances the achievement for every student, we engage and expand partnerships through culture of love, inclusion, and trust. That may sound familiar. Uh, continue to support effective and transparent communication with feedback opportunities, which is two-way communication, uh, and leverage school operations and resources to reflect district priorities with a continued focus on the Cushing and Hadley MSBA project. We can do all that, which I think we can, then together, which I love there, together, we inspire, support, and challenge all learners to reach reach their unique potential as you see back to the mission. So this is all that tied in into one if then statement, which in five years when we will look back, we will have accomplished all of this. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna now break this down into some objectives and initiatives to give you a little flavor of what each of these categories may look like. Um, let you enjoy those photos for a while there, okay. <laughs> And we broke those down into a few objectives. The first one, obviously, is teaching, learning, and leading, uh, which is a, a new take on the old teaching and learning. We, we love the addition of leading, which a member came up with. Um, so this is uh, provide authentic student experiences in a safe, equitable, and inclusive environment that enhances achievement for all students through aligned and high-quality curriculum, utilizing strong instructional practices facilitated by highly qualified, diverse workforce. You know, there's a, there's a lot happening in that couple of sentences there. We included a, um, what we try to do in this document is we took a lot of the information and try to strategically put it in here uh, in a smart way. So even that last sentence, a highly qualified, diverse workforce, you'll see equity in there. Um, so these are goals we still have to work on that are placed in this document. The first one is uh, 
implement uh, the three priority recommendations from the equity audit, and it gives an outcome and a responsible person right now. So students and staff understand um, how to create a culture of love, inclusion, and trust, and actively work to ensuring individuals have a sense of belonging. Now, again, unique to situate, and one that we were passionate about having was uh, the lit word, love, inclusion, and trust. That came from, from some of our student groups that responded back. And that was a strong thing. And again, you won't see that in any other strategic plan that I know of, in that sense of belonging. But I like how it's tied right back to the stuff we're doing in lit um, and the responsible uh, you know, director. And we put all positions here, you know, so this can stand the test of time. But who's in these positions? Uh, in this case, would be Mr. Adams, Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And please know these responsibilities are just right now getting some direction from Ed and the team from TLA. These are our initial starting points. You have to have someone accountable for, so during the year, when I say, okay, let's have some presentations on the strategic plans of the school committee, we'll say, okay, um, you know, objective one, three priorities, Jamil, you're gonna to present tonight. But what we'll be spending time over the next phase of this is, is to actually over the summer during our retreat leadership and then working with teachers, actually breaking down what the action steps are and who are responsible, all the way down to students, kids, teachers, community members. So that's to be determined right now, right? But the person responsible for making sure all that happens would be the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in this particular example. The next one is maintain a document, uh, documented curriculum in alignment with uh, the state standards. Obviously, curriculum is a huge part of what we're about as educators. So uh, all SBS students uh, have a vertically and horizontally aligned uh, curriculum experience across grades, schools, and uh, courses driven by SBS portrait of the graduate. So there's a lot of things in here, and it's already a work in progress, and Heidi might be able to speak to some of this that is already in the way. But a new twist that's in there is that last uh, phrase, portrait of a graduate. Uh, that's NIAS BAS, uh, backed, but it's also uh, research based. And basically, it's backwards design of okay, when our children graduate from situate public schools, what are the skills and strategies and um, characters, characteristics we want them to have? So, that's a whole process that we have to do. It's one of the first things we'll have to do. That's again <coughs> similar to this on a little smaller scale with the community involved and everyone involved when we come up with that. And so then we can say, okay, if this is what we want a graduate to have, what do we want someone leaving Gates to have those skills? What do we want someone leaving the 85th grade? And that will get you consistency and will get you focused. And, that, uh, and then we have to ensure our, our uh, curriculum was aligned to those portrait of graduates. So a huge undertaking there, but something that we don't have and we should have. So again, we put it in here so we're accountable for doing so. And uh, Heidi will have the you know, pleasure of overseeing that task. The next one is expand knowledge and uniform practices of a multi-tiered systems of support, which is just uh, good education for all students, uh, that equal opportunities for all children, uh, proactively, not reactively, uh, and we're not doing that uh, greatly here, in a great, in a great way, so we can do a lot of improvement there. Again, nobody's fault, but now we have to call the elephant out of the room that we need to do this to have a great district. And so that's the academic and social emotional skills find success both in school and after graduation. So um, Dr. Bobert right now will be overseeing that. Any questions or comments on those three important topics? Comment real quick. I want to say Superintendent Burkett, I appreciate you acknowledging and calling that third piece out there with the MTSS that, you know, coming from superintendent means a lot to hear that acknowledgement of, hey, this is an area we have a lot of work to do and we're going to focus on it and expand it and, you know, how important it is for all students and it's important for our staff and teachers and everyone in the SPS community to feel that they have the social and emotional support in, in there. So uh, I think that's really welcome and a really important shift for us. You know, not that nothing's, you know, not to say that work isn't being done, but just that it's a focus area is... I think really great. Yeah. And I want to thank the whole group. That was a, that one I think clearly rose to the top from everything we all the data we got. Mm -hmm. I agree. Just to comment, um, I think when I read this, I think about and worry a little bit for you about accountability 
And so I think at some point it's going to be really helpful for all of us to be thinking about what do the measures look like? Because right now, looking at the outcome that says, you know, there's just a lot of double barreled and triple barreled and quadruple barreled outcomes in there. So I think when you think about like your fall goals, just being, you know, I've been on you about this since I started, like making sure that they're singular objective and a singular outcome so that we can say, yep, check, check under progress or not done or so. Cause I just think it's gonna be hard to say, are we doing objective one if we're not really clear on what the, what the measurables are? Yeah, and I 100% agree and thank you for pointing that out. And I think, you know, now that we've got these bigger outcomes, we have to yeah. really narrow these down and strategically plan from year to year over the course of the five years so we have measurable targets. So thank you for that. I think this is going to help us. But yeah, right now that these are so big yeah. that we that's begins our summer work and you know in, in talking to Ed and learning about other folks that have done strategic plans. That, that's why there's some flexibility in this yeah. because then we can have okay we can do this year one and two and then we found out after year one Right, we reached this, we didn't quite get to this, right? We can span that like that. We have to be very strategic and specific and, and not, you know, this is nice to see, it's, it's yeah. beautiful, but it's so big yeah. that it needs, it needs a little more detail, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I would love to see, if you could geek out for a second, almost a theory of treatment diagram. Yep. So like year to year, you have your, at the right-hand side, you have your proximal and distal outcomes. So you're able to say this year, we're gonna do these things and we're gonna to start touching on these distal things, but we won't complete that, right? Like, right. I just think that would make yeah, it good. clean. You got that, Heidi? Well, we, were, we are doing you know the action. I was hoping you'd look back. We are doing the action steps next. So that is the next phase <coughs> and the actions will be measurable and will be in much shorter time periods. And you will see principals attached to them or department chairs because it is impossible for any one person to do all of that and the action steps which happen after this if you approve this strategic plan um, is the work that we'll do thank you thank you Annie. next slide so we talked about communication obviously huge uh i think we make great strides so far um and community partnerships we added we've added to that um we talked about tonight that this is you know we need everybody involved in this um, two-way street so continue to strengthen communication and build support and collaboration am among school community and town partners and that, that should always be a goal and we can always do better so that's going to be on there so enhanced communication systems and strategies and the overall outcome for that is students families and staff have clear concise consistent accurate timely easily accessible information and opportunities for two-way communication and feedback. Key there is the two-way. It's not just information sent out. An email doesn't count. We don't count that as two-way communication. Uh, something's posted on our websites. So we want to get so we do a lot of surveys, we do a lot of focus groups, conversations, and we really want to uh, continue to improve on that. And then involvement in our hiring processes with community members, family members, staff, um, and some of those things as well as uh, something I talked to um, Marie about recently, and I know Dr. Krakowski has been involved in this, we had mentioned it, um, some ways we can enhance our support for our staff uh, moving forward and what they've all gone through over these last few years and how we can internally build up leadership and supports within our own district, uh, which we really think fall into those system, uh, communication enhancement strategies. And then the next one is create, sustain a series of events that communicate, celebrate, and support core values with students, staff, and families. So what we felt was important, this came again, more organically, is that we're doing all this stuff, kind of like tonight, we have to see more of the celebrations of it. Like when you succeed at something, let's bring the kids out here, let's bring the staff out here, let's bring our, our community members out here that had played a role in this and share it with the greater community um, and to celebrate those things. And so uh, we've got some celebrations and traditions that are important to any great culture. But we can also en en enhance those and listen to what folks want to do and celebrate. Um, and so that, I think, is a huge part of, of um, any plan is to make sure that we celebrate those things that are going well and continue to acknowledge and appreciate people. Uh, last one. Objective three, finance facilities, uh, personnel and technology. We're all one category. 
Um, the MSBA project is a, a huge one. Thank you for everyone that's been involved in that. That is, uh, that continues over the summer. That's hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of time. And we've got our friends in the oh, back that are waiting, <laughs> waiting patiently. I should, so told, I should have told me eight o'clock, but over six by accident. Um, so hopefully we'll only get billed to two hour minimum. Um, but they've been great, the and and Vertex, and everybody on that committee, public. We got our best crowd at the last public meeting. Um, you know, and again, I said this before we did our last presentation, uh, we got a big one tonight on the ed plan. So we're really making great progress. Uh, I'm learning a ton and I'm loving it. And it's a really, it is truly a community um, project and something that will be very special. Hopefully in a few years, we cut that ribbon and allow our children and families and staff to be able to utilize it. So that MSBA project will be on there. Um, that's a, a vital one to us. The established programs and support mechanisms to recruit, retain staff, and ensure appropriate staffing levels. This goes back to this, some of these overlap, as you can see. This goes back to that first one with our equity audit to take a, to a look at our data and, and our hiring practice and such sustaining, sustaining staff. We, we have to start looking at that data and that we have data, that, uh, a staff that represent the children that come to school here in our community. And so that's going to be a high focus and that comes in two places, as you can see. And the next one's the safety practices and protocols, which include security, but also include emotional supports um, for our students and staff and, and families. And the last one is creating a comprehensive technology plan. You can see that one was kicked out one year with so much going on. That's the one we said, okay, we, we've got so much to do. Let's, let's give that a one year. Um, we did an audit last year, so we have a roadmap. Uh, but that we feel that's very important too, is to come up with a, a more comprehensive technology plan. So I think we cover a lot there. Okay, next slide. Set, uh, set sail, dream, explore, and discover. That concludes the presentation um, for this evening. Thank you again for everybody in the community that participated in this, which I think was a huge majority of our community. And for those that spent the countless hours um, coming up this beautiful and exciting document that we just can't wait to implement. Curious if any committee members besides Carrie and I who are so deeply involved had any, any final sort of, not necessarily final, obviously, we see email till tomorrow, but I don't want to keep our friends over there waiting any longer. Also, but just food for thought. If you all have any additional comments, I guess. No, yeah, I think this is a great strategic. You know, I've looked at the previous one. This is just so it's it's simple, but um, has a lot in it. Um, and it's just clear, mm -hmm. and that's. Um, you know, I have to say that I don't even recall how the other strategic plan was built. I think it was just created. So to have this is exciting and it's um, kind of throws a new light on what the next five years are gonna look like. I think it's great. And I also feel as though, um, I do feel as if everyone's ideas and, and have risen to the top and that we've identified all of them through the objectives and the goals. So I'm excited about it. If I could have created a document, I would have had a lot of these ideas as well. I would have liked to think I had some of these ideas. Well, you were in the focus group, so your ideas are in here. I love the community one. I love the community one, but I think all of them are great. And I don't think that um, the strategic plan is so large that it's not obtainable that we can't meet these goals. I think that they're reachable. Um, and I think that we will be successful in doing so. So thank you for everyone. I know, I, I don't know exactly how many hours, but I know you guys had a lot of meetings. So I appreciate all the work. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll just echo everyone else's thanks to the committee, but um, I also, one thing I've been thinking about is um, I like that the strategic initiatives that are up there are chosen, um, are narrow enough that they feel like we can actually work on those, but it's also important to acknowledge that the outcomes that they're paired with, there's a lot more that goes into those outcomes besides just those strategic initiatives, and so I just think that'll be an important thing to communicate. I agree, thank you. Good feedback. Right. Uh, we are going to vote on this plan. Right. So, uh, so, motion, Janet. <laughs> we don't 
have to have it you if you want to change it. I don't for this particular year. Maybe these do want to it. I make a motion <laughs> to approve the 2023-2028 Central Public Schools strategic plan. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're going to talk about all that. Okay. I decided not to die today. That's fine. Okay. But I agree. All right. Thank you all for your support. Thank you. Actually, that does remind me of one thing, Carrie, is that we, you know, we'll, we can use, obviously, we'll use this document to be great for us to sort of think about our goals, whereas previous to this, we sort of were pulling from various other places. And yep. this is just an awesome opportunity for us, too, I think, as a committee. So looking forward to that. All right. Assistant Superintendent Driscoll, MSBA Cushing Hathaway Project Education Plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like Bill said, sorry, apologies for the late. Now you know everything you ever wanted to know about the show calls. Can I just introduce our guest? Yes. Jason Bull and Dal Walter from DW. Going with you. Thank you. And uh, John Lemieux from Vertex, our OPM, our president, if we needed them for backup our questions. And Dr. Dutch is still here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, what I am sharing with you tonight is an overview of the MSBA educational program. So an educational program plan informs the school design. Um, so that means when um, our architects and our school building committee are talking about what our school building may look like, um, they need to talk about what education looks like. It's very important to know that what we're building um, this building for isn't just for education of today and tomorrow. It's for about the next 40 or 50 years um, that we'll be using this building. Um, so it's really important um, that uh, our <coughs> visioning committee and our um, work group and our building committee understand our teaching and learning practices. And when we're designing, we are thinking about flexibility to accommodate for future changes. And what the team did is they walked our visioning team um, through a series of activities to help us um, to be able to give input. So here are some key factors that are in the educational plan. Um, the plan is to consolidate Cushing and Hatherley to serve 460 students in grades kindergarten through five. We are considering adding spaces to the project to both relocate and expand the district's pre-K program. Questions about that? I, I have one question. I thought in um, prior iterations, I'd heard that the one percent pre-K would stay, but this your, but this would this would move that to this building, so it'd all be in one building. That the, if pre-K is added, all pre-K at least initially, would be in the new building. And so yeah. how many seats is that all together? I want to say it's five classrooms. Okay. okay. If I just might add to that, um, and the thought process behind that is the, um, especially the, the outside facilities, the playground, and things like that are not accessible for all children. So moving that would be one great thing. Um, also to expand the number, we do have waiting lists on uh, pre-K. So that's another uh, opportunity. And something that's brought up at the community and public meetings is that the ability of if you build it, they will come, which we've seen in all the new schools where more people would, even more people want to come to situate to go to school. Uh, this moving would allow classroom space at Wampatak and other schools to, uh, if, should we get it, uh, more students and children growing up in the town, we have space so that we immediately would outgrow the building. So for all those reasons, and my last plug for that, because I think tonight on the agenda it says vote. And, it's not a vote, it's just feedback we'd like um, for this. And then 
One thing we would want feedback is on whether you support pre-K or not, because that's something that will help us narrow this down and look at, and just to give you some uh, background on that, the, uh, the entire building committee unanimously supported that uh, pre-K, and in the last public meeting of about 30 people, we did a straw vote, and 100% of people supported that. The last rationale, I think, for that is because I do envision very soon, especially in Massachusetts, being at the forefront of education, that universal pre-K is coming our way, and we will be ahead of the curve in that. So for all those reasons, I would advocate that you support pre-K in the building. Thank you. And if we're plugging things, um, all of our building committee meetings are public meetings, and they really do get into detail. Um, and we would, of course, invite every member of the community to also come to our public meetings to discuss these because um, there's a lot more detail that goes into those. Um, the second section we have here is about learning. Um, so these are the key elements of learning in situate public schools. Programs and services will continue to be consistent with the philosophy of universal design for learning. So that means we are planning to serve all students, all, all types of learners. Um, the design of the space and, spaces in the project must be as flexible as possible to allow for changes to the educational model over the lifespan of the building. You think of what education looked like 40 years ago, and we're still using the same building, um, we need to make sure we are being as flexible as possible. Um, and the third one is to celebrate and promote literacy in a reimagined library media center space that will serve as a learning commons for literacy across the curriculum, including digital literacy. And so these are some bullets that are key features in um, most of the designs and things that the visioning committee really wanted to put forward. Um, design features to support the safety and security of students, adults, visitors, and guests. A centrally located learning commons that is highly visible upon arrival, celebrating literacy, but really we, we've used the words learning on display um, many times. Um, five pre-K classrooms. Oh, I'm glad I was right about the five. I, we weren't on that slide yet, but yes, five pre-K classrooms. Um, and there'd be four classrooms per grade level um, for kindergarten through five, not pre-K through five. A dedicated art room with a separate room for a kiln. Um, right now, um, the kilns are in um, custodial areas, not appropriate, but there it's not an appropriate space long term. Um, we have a de dedicated music room with separate practice rooms, a gym that's enclosed um, and separate from classrooms. Um, as you know, right now, our gym is connected to many classrooms. Um, site features to support out outdoor learning activities, community events, and um, minimize traffic congestion. Purposefully design, designed special education spaces for specialized programming. Resource rooms and therapy spaces to support students' individual needs. Professional collaboration areas for faculty and staff and professional office and working environments for administrators, interventionists, and other support personnel. Oh, and at the top, there's a little note. If we did go with the K-5 building, that would be 90,000 square feet, about and if we went the pre-K to five building, it would be about 100,000 square feet. Okay, yes, great. Um, we wanna thank all of our visioning committee members. So I know we just talked about the strategic plan. Um, nearly simultaneously, actually I think sometimes simultaneously, we had this visioning committee um, happening as well as the strategic plan. This group met um, for hours on end, um, really getting into some um, detail about um, about our building and about teaching and learning. Um, so we had teachers represented, we had administrators, we had students, and we had parents. So we thank everybody who was a part of those um, the visioning committee. And these are some of the results. Um, purposeful innovation. Um, and this quote, we use this, um, people gave their own anonymous feedback during some of these sessions. So um, we chose a quote that really represented some of the design patterns that were selected. Um, fun learning, space size variety, outdoor activities, and school common space. And so the design patterns that were selected were um, flexible and varied environments for different activities, hallway learning, 
Media Technology Center as a central public connective tissue, uh, extended learning spaces, and maximizing storage to the extent possible. Um, guiding principles, universal design for learning, an inclusive pathway, a school where children and community can grow together. Some of the design patterns are visible learning that includes and serves all learners, quiet spaces, learning places to allow, allow for whole body learning, breakout and collaborative spaces, shared spaces between classrooms, push-in services for SEL and special education and inclusive learning spaces, and dedicated collaboration spaces for adults. Outdoor connections do what is best for student learning and instill a lifelong sense of wonder and purpose. Strong indoor-outdoor connections provide direct access to daylight and views age-appropriate, engaging, varied experiences for outdoor play and exploration, safe drop-off and pickup. Oh, um, it's been a long meeting. Okay. Um, and safe drop-off and pickup to limit traffic and provide entrances with easy supervision and a gym with fields immediately adjacent. So this is a sample of um, a tiny piece of one of the activities that we did. There were tons and tons of design patterns and everyone on the visioning committee um, put dots um, to indicate whether they loved this, whether they, so it was actually green, yellow, or red. Red was absolutely no, green was we love this, and yellow was um, neutral. Um, so this was, the sheet for the welcoming entry. This is, is an example of the sheet for agile spaces. You see not even any yellows or reds on this one. And from all of those, this was created. And if you've been to the public meetings, they are way beyond this at this point. Um, but this is a very general drawing of what a learning space might look like for our new building. Um, the building committee members, um, again, they are beyond this point substantially right now. Um, we want to thank people from the town, the administrators, our school committee members, and our community members who are on the building committee. And we want to remind everyone in the community, um, anywhere who wants to look, please check out our Cushing and Hatherley MSBA project um, website link. If you go to community on sit.org, SCIT.org, and then just click Cushing and Haverly MSBA project, you'll have a full project history. You'll have um, all of the information from the building committee meetings. There'll be announcements for our meetings and forums, the progress and timeline, and um, any opportunities for community input. Um, this slide, I'm sure you've seen versions of this many times um, at this point. Um, we are at the place where we would make our PDP submission. This um, plan is a part of that PDP submission. Um, and I, I don't think anything else has changed other than, okay. And I can answer questions about the learning plan itself. And we also have our wonderful architects here who can answer questions about the building. Questions? Thank you. Questions? All right. <laughs> Actually, I do have a question. Um, just a quick question. Did the naming of the building piece that came up in some conversations I had with parents, I forget what where in the timeline that falls in terms of that process and how that gets determined. So that's not formally a part of our process with um, the architects, that's something that we as a district would decide. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that that will be one of the action steps that we discuss <laughs> when we get to the next step um, of the strategic plan that you just approved. Because it's more than just naming the building, we have to have a plan for bringing the two communities together. Right, right. Yeah. Mine's like super quick. So for the spatially challenged, 90,000 square feet versus 100,000 square feet. Do we have a building in the district that looks like that size? Like, just so I can have a sense of what that looks like? Probably the easiest comparison to make is that the existing Hatherley building in Cushing 2 is 40,000 square feet. 
Okay, that's so. What, that's so what's being proposed is a little more than twice as big yep. as the Hatterley School. That's super helpful. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I was at the last public meeting, so that again, we have an easy job because we're not going to commit to ask questions. You guys have pondered for hours. Um, this doesn't discuss the location. Is that location still to be determined, or have we settled on? The particular site that's not appropriate for tonight. So this preliminary design program submittal that's going to go in Friday, actually Thursday, uh, Thursday. <laughs> um, the biggest decision in that process is to go from the many options to the few. Okay. And so we've gone through um, quite a rigorous process of evaluating all of the options on the table and. Um, what's going to be submitted is six options, some for each grade configuration. Um, so they all happen to be on the Hatherley site. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, I know we're not voting on this, but I think the question was asked about pre K, so I wasn't sure if it was appropriate to discuss that. Go for it. Yeah. Please. Um, I, I just wanted to express my support for it, having been to a lot of these meetings, having been the, on the visioning committee. This was something that um, I've seen discussed multiple times with multiple stakeholders, and I think it's universally seen as a good idea. I also agree with Bill that this is something that it's very likely in the future um, we will want and need spaces for pre-K, and so I think to think ahead. And lastly, as a parent of a three, almost four-year-old who just paid my final year of daycare, <laughs> um, I can tell you that finding um, appropriate full day care is really hard. There's a, a big shortage, a lot of scrambling, and to afford children the opportunity to attend that program in our system is a really amazing opportunity that we should definitely consider. Thank you. So to piggyback on Maria's point, you, you want us to probably all, <laughs> since we're not voting, maybe you can make a comment or at least. Just any feedback on tonight, okay. but Ian, just Ian, the pre-K. I fully support the free k for all the reasons that um, that you have stated. I guess my only question, which is a little bit out of scope, is we would have to come up with what the Wampatuck pre-K classrooms would look like once that transition. But that would be for further discussion. Yes. But I fully support. I think right. that what Maria said, and I think, um, I mean, there's no reason not to do, especially when we can get potential. I know we talked about last time reimbursement or whatever, 30 to 42 percent or whatever the real number is to, to get this bill. Yeah, and thank you for bringing that up for a community that's listening. I was to watch this later on. That that's a huge piece that the um, the pre-K is also reimbursable. So that's a big piece. Yeah, I would agree. I fully I'm fully in support of pre-K as being included in the project as well for all the reasons everyone said. And I think it's uh, also important because it sort of, that's a, even if you don't have young ones or, you know, babies at this point who would be in there, it does sort of bring, it feels more community inclusive to me. It does feel like it's the future. It seems really short-sighted to not include it. Um, it's definitely more cost-effective than some sort of a retroactive fit when we need more space. So I think it's, for all those reasons, I fully support it. Now, I agree with everything that I support. Yeah. Oh, turn back on. Yeah, I. No, you didn't. You didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want me to talk. Or <laughs> no, it's still there. We go. Yeah, I fully like support it. I just feel like this is another opportunity for Situate to be leading the way and for people to be looking to us just like they do with DEI. So I think that's awesome. Thank you, Superintendent Burkett. Would it be appropriate to talk about what the process is for making this decision relative to the USDA process in this in this upcoming step? <clears throat> that would be very helpful. <clears throat> so, um, you want to like. Just because we have people online that yeah, might be listening. So, so. There's literally just me and Seth. Watch the recording. They watch it. Yeah. Um, so, 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 anytime a project changes the grade levels that are in a particular building, the MSBA considers that a grade reconfiguration. You'll hear that 
turbo lot in the next several weeks. <clears throat> so what needs to happen is at some point before we make our next submission, what's called the PSR submission, the school committee will need to take a vote that this is what they want to do. They want to change the project grades that are in that building from K-5 to pre-K-5. And the design team is going to um, develop <clears throat> and cost estimate all of the options that are still on the table, including those that are K-5, so that everybody, uh, when they have the discussion about this uh, grade reconfiguration, has a full understanding of the costs that are associated with incorporating pre-K into the project. So all of those conversations, any questions you have about that, and ultimately the vote that needs to take place will happen in this next phase, um, which is going to be submitted in August. I know. Maybe. So, do we go through the process for gates? Because I know that we have yes. it at the school. Yeah. The exactly the same process as you went through for gates. If we need to have a meeting, we can. We'll get the dates to you. Okay. July? Oh. <laughs> Try not kidding. No. We have that early August. We could yeah. do it in yeah. August 7th. We'll, we'll figure it out. We can't freeze right now. Can we vote on it now? We can't. We can't? Oh, you can't. What about other? Oh, yeah, other businesses. Okay. <laughs> well, we have a meeting on the 26th. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Too early or could that be done? No, any, anytime you do that would be appropriate. It won't change what we have to explore in terms of our due diligence in this phase. It just helps with what the ultimately the preferred option that gets selected at the end of the next step would be. For example, we might shape criteria that preference options that have pre-K in them versus ones that don't have pre-K in them. Um, so that vote could happen anytime between now and we make that next submittal. Yeah, it'll be important that the meeting be appropriately noticed. Everyone knows that it's there so that everybody from the community can come and speak to it um, because that has to be part of the submission as well, not just you know, the, the agenda item, the posting, yeah, the okay. response, okay. the vote, and then okay. the minutes ultimately all go into the, the record. Because remember, you're going from the many to the few, yeah. and then the few to the one. And it's that, at that next submission, you've decided on the one, and then the last phase of the process is during where you're taking that one and going to town on it and yeah. developing a design, basically to almost 25% complete. That's the one that gets the cost and the vote, you know, with the town and all of that so as long as it fits with what you need and msba needs i think we all would feel comfortable voting on the 26th just for you know that would give you all plenty of time, plenty of time. and i would say if you felt like there was any hesitation or anyone had any additional information they wanted or something holding us back that maybe we would want to take longer than the 26th but i mean honestly i talked to like I can't even give a number, hundred people voted just at soccer and baseball and everywhere and lacrosse. I've not heard one negative feedback about adding pre-K at all. You know, a few clarifying questions and then, oh yes, absolutely 100%. So not to say that a person couldn't be opposed that's out there that hasn't, you know, heard the information, but with the proper postings and everything that will give us feedback time. So, sounds good to me, everyone else thinks so. No, I do. And then out of school, out of school with MSBA, I know I've asked this a couple of times, but I think, again, out of the scope of what they need for the vote, but I think it would be helpful to know what we potentially envision for the current pre-K at Wampatuck. And then also, I, I think that the town's on but what the Cushing site's going to look like as well. I know that they're on, I know that you guys have, I brought that up before, I know that you guys said that you have a, just a rough ask, a global line type of ask. And just, I think that those type of questions are going to come up. And if we at least have a base understanding of what our options are, we could potentially better defend them just right. generically in conversation. What like graduation was that yeah. article about like turning into the hockey rink? Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. And the pool, and then the pool people come in. Hockey yeah. rink, cool. Yeah. Yeah, there's a room that yeah, it's going to be a hockey rink or a pool. Or both. Or both. Like when? That's what I said. Sounds good to me. We're good then. Thank you all so much. Sorry for the late night. We appreciate it. Though. All right. Let's see. Approval of minutes from March 27. Whoa. Really? Yeah.
to approve the May 1st, 2023 minutes. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Again, four yeses and one abstention. Right, uh, saw mm -hmm. no warrants. So, one warrant. Oh yeah, there it is, warrants we read the minutes. There's one warrant to read into the record. Uh, warrant number S230525, a total of $474,372.20, of which $196,479 is out of our local funds. Food services, $30,637.57. For the Situate High School locker room, uh, phase two, $23,924.50. That's for architectural fees. SHS student activities, $25,886.21. That's for the model UN trip, the French trip, and scholarships. AP exams, $49,612. And those are funds that come in and, and go out where it passed through. Private school tuition, $122,181.35 to a variety of private schools. Facilities, $19,000 to the engineer for the Jenkins roof project. Uh, just for informational purposes, that has gone out to bid, has been awarded, came in under our anticipated budget, and they will start that project on June 26th. Out of our uh, LEA funds, private school tuition, $97,535.78. Collaborative tuition, $13,200. Special ed transportation, $16,189. Um, custodial supplies and contracted services, $13,194.82. Uh, primarily for uh, filters at the high school, which we change out quarterly. Uh, those are the only large, or all of the large items. Questions, if you have any, I'm happy to answer them. Questions? Thank you. Okay, um, no correspondences. Any other business anyone has that they would like to know? No, just uh, congratulations to all the seniors um, oh, yeah. and everyone that put together the uh, the graduation ceremony. I think everyone, well, we had our weather expert there, I guess Mr. <laughs> McGuire and uh, Superintendent Burkhead <laughs> recognized the thunder in the distance. And yeah, he, that was some quick maneuvering. Yeah, he showed sure up his speech, I think, by half. But I don't think anyone really <laughs> knows. The best feedback I ever got. So <laughs> <laughs> do a woman's, women's speeches are my specialty. <laughs> but the fact that we were able to get that in was always awesome. And I think it's one of my, I don't know, it's one of, it's one of the more rewarding experiences at school can We get to go and so this is kind of what we work for to some degree. We see these kids at the end. Yeah. Um, and it, it's really nice to, to participate and to um, have a little bit of a role in it to see those kids be happy. So I just wanted to thank Superintendent Burkhead and everyone. I know you, you um, recognize everyone, but it is a big event to put on. Uh, and to coordinate. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Um, future. Okay. Anyone have anything? I don't know if you're going to repeat those all out, but obviously, he's on positions for next time, thinking about what um, subcommittees and liaison appointments you want to. If you have an interest in in particular, ask, maybe I'll. 
But isn't one of the good things we don't have yes. school <laughs> count? Have you said that? You can say it. No I can say it? Yeah. Well, we didn't we vote it on the well, I think the policy. We didn't vote it yet, but. Okay, we're well, no, not going to say it. Here's the chair. No, you don't no. have to say it. Nope. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Not, huh? what? It's not a part of the policy. Yeah. yeah. We'll, be, yeah we'll be able to cross those positions off of our list in terms of school council representative. So that would be nice. Not that we don't love that. It's just it's a lot. It's difficult to get to. Yeah. All right. Excellent. And I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.